One of the things that may not be obvious um, about the technology is where it started, what the history of that is, which helps you understand what the direction is. It also understands you how, helps you understand how all the different pieces of this come together. So I want to talk about how we got here in terms of audio over IP networks, why that matters at all, and where we think this is going. So how did we get here? I'm going to take you back quickly to 1974, when a group of very smart people started to look at a set of rules to move data over networks. Uh, this was uh, part of the development of what was then known as the Advanced Research Projects uh, Group, ARPA, uh, in the States. And they came up with this model for <laughs> the layers of information, data, how you manage stuff on network. And since 1974, this has been the standard that's guided the development of networks. We're in almost to 2020 now. So this has been around for a long time. Audio over Ethernet lives on these first two layers. If you've been in the audio industry or the video industry, if you've been doing theater or doing pro sound, then you know names like CobraNet, uh, you know names like EtherSound, you know React. There are all of these standards whose purpose was to move audio from point X to point Y. Or really, in theater and in pro sound, to move audio from the stage to a house console, to a monitor console, and possibly to a recording rig. So it was one point to a couple of other points. And all that stuff lived here. Uh, I put it at the top, it's layer one. Those, that's the lowest layer. The physical layer is how many wires in this connection? What's the standard connector? What's the impedance of this? The data link layer is how do I tell you I'm, I'm going to send you a message and you tell me that you're ready to receive it? How do you tell me that you've received it and that you're ready for me to send another one? That sits on the data link layer. Audio over IP, what is being used for modern exchange of audio in broadcast. That lives at the network layer, the IP, the internet protocol layer. That's the layer that tells me how to go from my network to your network. It's what tells your PC when you open a browser and you want to look at my website, how to navigate from Australia to New York where our web servers are located. This is where audio over IP lives. So on the left, some of these you should have some knowledge of. This is where they started, 2011, AVB. Everybody may know AVB. All of this stuff lives on layer one and layer two. All of these are entirely proprietary protocols. They were never intended to let you get information from any other system. AVB is standards-based, but again, it's entirely proprietary. It is not intended for you to connect other network systems to it. And this development has been going on for a long time. In fact, if we go back to 1990, a company called Dalet Digital Media Systems brought a server to NAB and brought a client PC and showed that you could request music from the server and deliver it. They didn't even have a name for it. It was just, yeah, we're using the Ethernet to carry audio. It's going to be very cool because it can be shared. They never even bothered to name it or patent it. They've done this for years and years and years. That is actually. 1996 years earlier than this. So this is what characterizes audio over Ethernet protocols. And any one of these is a reason why it has not come into broadcast. So we don't have to spend a lot of time on that. This is a representation of where networking that's used in broadcast has come from. 1974, this internet protocol, the layer three of that ISO model, that's where that model was created. Real-time protocol, just in the uh, early 90s, a real-time protocol. The telephone companies actually changed to voice over IP. The telephone companies stopped being a TDM link between COs all over the place that then had boxes which switched it to copper wire to your home. Internally, they started to use networking. Out here on the edge, that last slide that I showed you that had all of those audio over Ethernet protocols. So back here somewhere, when 
Ethernet switches were available. And some of those didn't even use Ethernet switches. They used their own protocols. They borrowed some of that stuff. And that is a branch that has gone off on the side. But here, IEEE 1588. And boy, when you talk about this, there are a lot of acronyms and a lot of abbreviations. And I include some of them here because if you want more information about the source of this stuff, this is the source information. IEEE 1588, how do you put time on a network that's very accurate? This is not network time protocol. This is orders of magnitude more accurate than network time protocol. So if you don't know NTP, if you're on a network and the network tells your PC what time it is and tells it when to change to daylight savings time, that's all done with NTP, network <coughs> uh, protocol. This is much, much more accurate. Livewire actually should be just a little lower on the tree because Livewire in 2003, when it was introduced to the industry, was before IEEE 1588. Livewire has its own timing protocol, which actually can exist on the network simultaneously with 1588, which is also known as uh, PTP, Precision Time Protocol. So Livewire predated this in its design. Ravenna came after 1588. Now, Livewire and Ravenna have long interoperated. So if you have gear from us and you have interfaces, there's actually a tab for Ravenna where you can see Ravenna sources. And in Ravenna, there's tabs where you can see Livewire sources, and those can be exchanged between devices freely. As this grows up, Dante, Dante is off on a branch. It's a branch because they're using the original 1588-1 timing protocol, which is not compatible with the 1588-2008 uh, protocol. Uh, it's more accurate, and uh, their legacy devices are not part of that. So it's off on the side. There's Wheatnet. Those of you who know Wheatstone, there's a, uh, something they call Wheatnet, which is exchanged between their TDM consoles. The X192 committee, that was a committee of broadcasters and other audio professionals that got together to see if they could standardize transport of audio using IP. That became AES67. Our CTO, who originally developed Livewire back in 2002, we went there, we provided our intellectual property. The people from Ravenna showed up, they provided um, stuff, and then other people from the industry got together, and that's AES67. And a little higher than AES67, you see the new SMPTE standards. We'll talk a little bit about why this stuff is important, we think. Um, right, so um, I, I just I want to put things in perspective. If you've been doing radio with audio over IP, you've been doing it since 2003. And in 2003, a 10 megabit network was a really fast network. And guess what? A pair of audio uh, over Ethernet is about 2 meg. So if you have a 10 meg network, if you, if you have a 100 meg network, that's a lot of audio channels. This is not interesting to television yet. Television at the time was 277 megabit standard definition. High definition, 1.5 gigabit, 4K, 12 gigabit, you're talking about networks that are running a gig. It's still not interesting. It's not even interesting at 10 gig because it's only one or two streams with a little bit of overhead. But now we have 40, 80, and 100 gigabit networks. This is suddenly interesting in television in a way it was never interesting before. So this is not new technology at all. Uh, 2003, we released it. We've been doing this for 15 years. Other companies, if you add their sales of IP structured stuff to this, the numbers are huge in terms of professional use. The guess at the factory is that there are one and a half million live wire streams going on on the planet at any one time, and tens of thousands of those are going to air. It's been used in professional broadcast for 15 years. This is not new. It's the applications in television that are new. If you're looking now at the number of people who say they're audio over IP or AS60, they do AS67, 2015, 
we were the only ones at NAB or IBC that had a sign that said audio over IP. In 2016, <clears throat> we said bringing audio over IP into professional broadcast television. In 16, there were a couple of people there who went, oh yeah, yeah, we do audio over IP. This year at NAB, everybody who touched audio said, oh, we do audio over IP, we do AS67. We're an AS67 uh, company. So I wanna talk about what exactly that means. It is a future, and I'll show you some things that are being done with it so that you can see the application, but it is not yet something that you just take for granted and grab. You need to have some understanding of what's under the covers to make this stuff work. So Livewire Plus, and you'll see Livewire now advertised with a plus after it, is AES67 compliant. And I will tell you that AES67 has, I think once I made a mistake and said it was over 30, I think it's a 23 point checklist. A manufacturer has to check off all 23 boxes to be compliant. There are very few manufacturers that can do that. We absolutely can do that. So we are compliant. We find compatible to have no meaning at all. Um, we do advertisement control and routing. So what does that mean? AES67 is audio carriage. That's all it is. It gets audio from here to there <coughs> by itself. Audio over IP should not be more interesting to people than whether you like Belden or Gepco cable. Do you like a black and a red pair, or do you like a white and a green pair? It's wire. It connects one thing to another thing, and that's all it does. However, when you add advertisement control and routing, so advertisement, if I put something on the network, that stream on the network can announce to any device that can read the announcement what it is. You can name it anything you want. Transmitter two input, transmitter one input, mic one outputs. You can name it anything that you want and you can look at that list. Control, I can control things just simply by connecting the audio over IP stream to them. I can actually send commands and I can route using those commands. So these are three pieces which are critical but not part of AS67. The decision was to create an audio carriage specification as a first level and then have another committee and other work decide how to do these other pieces. Why does any of this matter? Because I just said it's only a piece of wire if it's just AS67. So the standards matter for just typical reasons. Everybody's timed the same way. Uh, it's high performance streaming of audio. It doesn't matter how many channels. You can put Maddie on AES 67. You can put a mono stream of audio on AES 67. It uses open standards. The leverage that broadcasters have with the IT industry is enormous. Left to the few television stations on earth, we could not have come up with 100 gigabit switches between 2000 and 2017. It never would have happened. AS67 as a standard is bound to the standards of networking. So it's off-the-shelf devices. Any off-the-shelf device, no. You cannot buy a little eight-port switch and expect to move a lot of audio through that because the switch has to know about precision time protocol. It has to know about quality of service. It has to know about VLANs. Can you get away with it in a small system? Absolutely, by experiment. But if you want to put down a network that connects things, there's much more to know. <laughs> Provides comfort to buyers. For me, that's the, most, that's the most important thing. What we would all like to be able to do is what we now do with SDI. Yeah, it's an SDI device that has an SDI input. I can use those two, those two things together, no problem. Well, maybe a little problem, but basically, no problem. 2110 for TV people. 2110 looked at AES67 and made the funnel even narrower. AES67 says, if you're going to interoperate with people, you're gonna do X, Y, and Z. You're gonna use packetization of the data like this. You're gonna use this time protocol. You're gonna have this information available about the stream that a device can pick up. 2110 to make it even easier for customers to know that things would interoperate. They narrowed it even more. 
so that devices that are 2110-30, that's the audio spec part of this. So this is how much range the 2110 standard in SMPTE covers. Um, again, if you're in radio, you're, you could be using any manufacturer's systems and those systems will work within themselves. When you move to TV, there is an absolute demand for best of breed. And best of breed means something different to me at NBC television in the States that it means to ABC television or it means to Maori television because the needs are different. So the best thing for my need may be different, but I want to leverage some of this technology and I'll show you what leverage means. But again, I want to make this really clear and this applies to our technology as well as everybody else's. Um, these are not regulated standards. There is no agency out there that says, oh, I tested your stuff. You can't say that it's compliant. I tested your stuff and you can say it. Manufacturers can say whatever they want. And there are manufacturers out there, for instance, that claim to be AES67 compliant that don't do SIP, Session Initiation Protocol, a one-to-one -one connection. That is a specification of AES67 it's the way the entire word of world, world of telephony works, point to point. You dial a number on a SIP phone and you are actually going to another IP address in the SIP network, a one-to-one -one connection. Compliance testing? No, 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 there is no compliance testing. You do whatever you want as a manufacturer and make whatever claims you want. It does not have discovery, it does not have control, it's nothing beyond audio transport. This is really important to remember if you are trying to get two pieces of gear to talk together. Anybody who's already tried this knows it's not the easiest thing in the world. There are people out there who are doing it, and I'll give you some examples. The manufacturers know what can and can't work. This is why discovery is so critical. Um, this thing, this session description protocol, um, this is part of what allows you to have caller ID. That session description protocol is what tells your phone who's calling, right? That's completely separate from the audio. That's the thing that says, here's the phone number it's coming from. That session description protocol, in terms of professional audio, AES67, um, that's a, a requirement. It gives you the source IP address of the device that's delivering the information. It tells you specifically what the timing is. It tells you how many audio channels are in the stream. It tells you how the audio channels are packetized. Does everybody understand packetization when I say packetization? So in analog audio, and you can include AES3 digital audio as essentially analog. It may be a digital representation, but it is a stream. It's a stream that is frame bound, but it is a stream of audio. When you go onto a network, you packetize data in the network. That packet has got some information about uh, correcting errors. It has a certain amount of data information in it. So in order for me to take a stream from your device to my uh, device, I have to know how many audio channels are in that. How do I break this up? How many, how many packets and how long are they of actual audio that I'm unpacking? All that stuff is right there if you've included it. So let's take a look at how this is done by various companies. Bonjour, everybody should know Bonjour. If you use a Mac product, Bonjour is used to tell you the printer names. It's used to tell you if there's a scanner on the network. It's used to tell you what the name of different PCs on the network is. It's been around for a while. Ravenna chose that as a standard. Uh, IS, uh, ISO 4, and this is where we get into, you know, the acronyms just start to run and run and run. ISO 4, that's that's a standard waiting to be adopted. So broadcast manufacturers got together. Um, that started with BBC creating something that they called NMOS, one more, one more acronym. Essentially, there's a group that's gathered all this information and held up their hand and said, we have a method for discovery, control, and routing. It's a general method, not owned by anybody. It's totally non-proprietary. Will somebody adopt this as a standard and put it forward as a standard? It has a lot of support by broadcast manufacturers because nobody owns it and because it's very extensible. The Livewire protocol 
that's our protocol. Uh, it is a control protocol that's been in existence longer than any of the others because we were the first to do an audio over IP protocol. And SAP, SAP is what Dante systems use to identify things within a Dante network. So if you're following standards, you know that every three months there is a plug fest where manufacturers get together and see what works with what. We provide one of our standard interfaces, which is AES digital audio to audio over IP. And what we put in that are all four of these discovery mechanisms and broadcast mechanisms. Mechanisms. It takes a lot of space. It uses an enormous amount of processing. We can't, don't want to do this as future development is, is to try and accomplish this for everything that's available. But it is possible. And we do show that if you talk one of these languages, you have some possibilities uh, to connect to other people. Uh, I talked about this briefly. That will just give you an idea of, of some of the minimum requirements for two devices to talk to one another. This is stuff that you can ask manufacturers. Do they do this? Do they abide by the AS67 minimum recommendations? This one in particular is part of 2110-30. So not only do you have to do the top three, but if you're going to do SIMTI, 211030 compliance, you're also at a minimum, if you offer more than a pair, you're going to offer every packet, every group of audio that you provide, you're going to offer a one millisecond packetization so that anybody else who knows the number of streams will know that that's how it's broken out and that's a compatibility mode. Practically speaking, what do you need to know? Well, somebody should support at least the AS67 interoperable requirements. If you do nothing with SIP and you don't plan to do anything with SIP, then, okay, there are some manufacturers who may say they don't do it. They probably won't tell you they don't do it, but you can ask them if they do it. Uh, what SIP is important for? If you have an outside call and you want that call to come to a key on the intercom and you don't want other things on the network to be able to grab that and listen to that, that would be a SIP call, point to point. There are lots of situations where you don't want someone to be able to grab that call from the network. A SIP call cannot be taken by someone else. It has a destination. Acceptance of streams by multicast address. Some of the people out there that are AES 67 compliant, they say, or they say we do AES 67, you cannot give them a multicast address. Or if you can give them a multicast address, they won't remember it when their list of addresses is reset. It is a temporary thing. And unicast addresses and multicast addresses with permanence, if you have a system and you lose power and it comes back up in broadcast, it better come up knowing all the connections. These two are very closely, these are very closely related, except up here, except this is streams by multicast, that can work at a very, very high level. Uh, for instance, between Ravenna and Livewire, you can go to a Ravenna system and you can look at a Livewire source. The source will tell you what it is because they share, we share our protocols with them. When it goes into their system, they can rename that and that system will remember what that multicast address is and what that name is. Uh, why is that important? Think of a phone call which has two directions or doing an IFB, doing a mix minus with an interrupt. You have to know over time where those things are. There's something else in here by assigning, meant by acceptance of streams and multicast. You should be able to switch streams in a broadcast environment without having a dropout, without having a glitch. Not all of the systems which claim to be AES 67 or AES 67 compliant can actually allow you to switch the streams without an audible click because they were designed to be point to point, defined for a show, defined for a while, but not to allow you to switch sources to the transmitter, taking one studio off and moving to a different studio. These are all the pieces of audio that broadcasters in radio and TV absolutely count on. There's, you just can't imagine right now buying a switch or putting in a system where when you change sources, you hear glitches on the air. We've been beyond that for a while. 
It is not true when you look across all the people who are doing AES 67. So if you're compliant, you really should be able to send and receive between two compliant devices. You may not be able to send 64 channels to a device that only understands how to receive two. So it, it's, it's not a guarantee. Uh, if someone has a receiver, an IRD, and they put an AS67 port on it, and that IRD sends out eight pair all the time. It sends out eight pair. If you have a device that only does stereo processing, it may not understand an eight pair send. So it's not a guarantee that they'll talk together. You really have to, you have to figure out what you want. And unfortunately, talk to manufacturers about what they actually do to see what's going to work and what's not going to work. So I, I want to go back to this. With all of this bad news, thousands of radio stations around the world have been using this reliably for 15 years. And it's, it's true for the people who do Ravenna. It's true for us. There are other companies out there that do pieces of audio over IP. And it's worked for a long time. So uh, that's why all this matters. Let's go back. So where are we going? Um, truly revolutionary changes. If you can imagine a, an intercom system that has no matrix. Intercom system starts with two belt packs for us. The intelligence is in each belt pack. You tell the belt packs their names. You tell the belt packs what they can talk to. The two belt packs are perfectly happy. As you grow, the system grows. It is the only intercom in the world that as you add panels, you don't reduce your capability to add more panels. You increase the ability. It's the only intercom system where every panel and device that goes into the intercom system actually increases the capability of the intercom system. That's revolutionary. People in radio, when was the last time you were in a radio station that had an audio cross-point matrix? When was the last time someone put in an analog cross-point matrix or an AES cross-point matrix in a radio station? That has ceased to exist. That is bad news for the people who make matrices, but for radio stations, it's been great. All the content is accessible in all places at all times because it streams on a network. That is going to come to TV. It is going to be revolutionary in TV. It's going to change everything. Companies that refuse to, to adopt to this, it may not be this year or next year, but over the next couple of years, they're going to become increasingly irrelevant. Because when you have to refresh a facility, you are not going to refresh a facility that requires tens of thousands of dollars into a proprietary cross-point matrix. The first one, that's already done. We are helping to make the second one happen. We released our intercom system at IBC of last year. Our first three or four installations, which are all beta sites, are going in right now. We expect to be to have production quantities of this at IBC. The 100 gigabit networks, when I go back, I am installing processing for a uh, television distributor. I'm doing loudness control and uh, uh, watermarking that they use for tracking audience. I'm going back to install that on a switch that has 48 gigabit ports and four 40 gig uplinks. The TV router router is a switch, both of these are from Arista Networks, that has 100, 400 gigabit uplinks and has 40 gigabit links to all of their video devices. And that is the third one of our, of our large distri distribution clients. It's the third client that is moving away from an infrastructure that has any cross point router in it at all. So there are people who are pushing this already. I'll give you an idea. Russian Media Group, four radio stations and one TV station co-located. The television engineer sits over all of them. His radio engineer said they wanted to go into an audio over IP system. Uh, he chose ours. After a year and all those stations up, he took out his console. Uh, he took out his telephone interfaces. He now has one Ethernet cable, which connects a control surface to a console. The console is a block of processing. His wireless uh, mics and his in-ears, wireless IFDs, they connect to an analog to audio over IP device that's live wire, one wire from the studio to the switch. Um, 
there is also room in there for him to have a speaker in the room so he can talk back and put program in the studio. Wherever they wanted audio, they simply run an Ethernet cable. They use a half rack device that we provide that has four AES ins and outs or has four analog ins and outs or has microphone preamps in it. Our hybrid, this hybrid, it speaks audio over IP on this side and it can speak SIP or analog on the other side. ITN in London, they have five studios. One studio is full-time leased by ABC New York as their London News Bureau. One of those is used by another British news company. And three of those studios, three, I can do that. Three of those are leased by the hour, by the week, by the month, uh, or by the year. Their issue, telephone lines. How do you allocate lines for shows? I want to come in and I want to do a call-in show and I want to have this many trunks coming in. I want a remote host on the phone. I want to be able to put two callers on the air and someone else says, I want to do that, but I'm also doing two news stories and I need a crew out. I need 10 lines to call in to get uh, IFB and I want that to be director IFB versus. So what did they do? A 2RU engine, which is SIP pointing toward the telephone company and which is live wire pointing to the inside. That's 8RU and 96 telephone interfaces. Those are 96 bi-directional telos hybrids, digital hybrids. From those hybrids, each, each room has got a piece of software and they can route phones to them. They can be pre-assigned on the outside and assigned to the studios. Within the studios, people have control. You can do caller control. All of that happens and there's a little switch and nodes which give them audio where they want it. So they took big patch fields. They took lots and lots of phone hybrids. They took lots and lots of couplers and they reduced it to what you see there. These are half racks and they fit in a rack together. Two, four, six, eight, nine rack units, 96 phone lines, full control. WSB TV station in Atlanta, Georgia, local station. They do 12 hours of news a day. It is nearly the same case. That's 4RU, 48 phone lines. Those phone lines, this is a little piece of software. It's from an application that we make. It's hard to see, but every one of those is an IFB. From the IFB are channels in the console. The console is not ours. The console is, uh, might be uh, Calrex in some of the rooms. They're done. They have someone who brings calls in and directs calls to studios. They have everything that they need right there. And they've reduced. So uh, ordinarily, that 48 phone lines, that would be 96 cables plus control. So it'd be 96 plus another 48 control lines. And that's all done with one Ethernet cable in each direction. ABC. In New York, same thing. 48 lines, nearly the same piece of software. It looks identical. This is a solution that is being repeated by broadcasters again and again. Uh, I will tell you that ABC did it in their Washington bureau. A wall with 48, in the US we call them princess phones. They're the phones that would hang in a kitchen. They were about this wide and this tall. They came in red. They had a wall with 48 phones. Next to each phone was a hook. So when someone called, you could listen to them. You could hang it up, not on the phone, but hang it on the hook. You threw a switch, which put audio on a coupler, and you walked over there to a rack that was six feet high that was all patches. And you patched an IFB or a mix minus to that particular phone. So they managed that with someone in their newsroom who walked back and forth to the phone wall to do things. And now they're doing all of that in a piece of software. Um, a completely different application of this. So those of you familiar with linear acoustic, we do loudness control for television. We do a lot of, we call it audio processing because we can take left channels or right channels only. We can do inserts and overrides for emergency audio. One box, traditionally one box per SDI channel. So a box of ours can do 
5.1 plus 2 plus 2, or it can do five different stereos and boxes you can build up to do 10 different stereos. But what all of those require is that you brought SDI to the box and you brought your audio to the box. What we did, a little half rack. So one rack unit is four SDI IO. Audio from those SDIs are de-embedded to Livewire, AS67. Um, a processing box. It is a, it's custom built for us to do what we need it to do, but that could be 25 stereo processors, or it could be eight 5.1s plus two plus two, just in that. If you compare the cost of our standalone boxes, if you have eight programs to do, you're a little bit ahead on this platform. If you have 28 to do, this platform saves you approximately $40,000 over individual boxes, and the amount of space it takes up is less than half. And it's all managed, and it's a little dark uh, in the picture, but that's actually a photo of the management console. Anybody who deals with matrix intercom systems in a TV environment, this probably looks very, very familiar. This is uh, off of one of the off of the website of one of the other manufacturers. This is this is how they look at um, moving things. It's, it's TDM core. These actually can't be separated by very, very much because they're on a TDM uh, connection. So there's a, a limit to distance. If you go outside of that distance, then you're going to use uh, trunk lines, you're going to have X, perhaps 128 to 4 or to 8 or to 16, depending on what you do. It's a very complicated look. That's the look of our intercom system. That's the look of our intercom system spread over distances. It's networked. You have fiber, you can do a couple of, of pairs at two megabits per second, you have dark fiber or you have room on a video link. This is IP, it routes. You can spread this out all over. No matter how many you have, the next one is the cost of the next one. You don't run out. Theoretically, there are 32,000 multicast addresses defined by the internet task force. So if you put in 32,000 devices, that's an I.O. for everyone. It virtually change. It just changes everything. And if you want to use this with an existing system, then you put the interface in that has Livewire on one side, Livewire Plus, because this is AES67. So where, where is all this going? This is what our commitment is. This is what our suggestion is look carefully at the companies and what the companies are promising and look carefully at what you're getting. There are a number of manufacturers that have TDM consoles that say they're AS67 compliant and they may be. You connect one TDM console to another TDM console. You connect a TDM bus to a box that goes to something else. But what they're not doing is actually taking all the information that's in that stream to the console. So next, Dan is going to talk to you about a particular application of technology to make, in this case, radio and TV work in the, in the greater world of social media. What they are doing is leveraging the fact that they can look at our console and they can look at a channel and they can know the audio source of that channel, they can know where the fader is on that channel, they can know if that's active or not active, because when we say pure audio over IP, for us, this isn't a connect point to point. For us, this is an underlying structure which goes through inside the intercoms. The intercom will be able to dial the phone without talking to a middle device. The intercom itself will talk to the telephone network and it will do it over that one connection. Two console systems talk to one another. If you define a device on the network as a four-wire device, that is something that has some audio in two directions, if it's defined that way, the console knows it. And as soon as it receives it, it creates a return address. And there's very specific rules that you can know about those addresses. What we have done 
since 2003 is to say, here is our underlying protocols. Here's how our system works. Anybody want to be a partner in this? You pay us one time for us to give you all this documentation and a sample board of the implementation. And you can put as many ports of this on as many products you make as you want. It was an open protocol, no royalties. We have a hundred people in the industry who already do that with us. You turn toward the larger industry, there is a problem here for people whose income is based on a matrix. They do not necessarily want to see this happen because the matrix is subsidizing their panel costs. The matrix is what they build it on. Everything is outside the matrix and a point to point connection. We think that that has a limited life. Um, we don't think necessarily that everybody else out there is wrong and that we're right. We're just showing you a world where there is a revolution that's possible. Uh, and we do have many, 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 many clients. And so we get to see a lot of what other people are doing and we get to try and interface it. Uh, I will not talk about other companies. They can represent themselves. I can only tell you specifically about us. But the warnings about what's going on in the world, those are from hard won experience. There, there are issues putting this together. We wish they weren't. We are committed to making that better. Uh, as fast and as well as we can. All of our partners we're, we're encouraging to do this, but this is what's going on in the world of standards. It is a painful process, but there is tremendous gain to be had uh, with the patients. So um, more and more manufacturers are jumping on this. Uh, that AMWA ISO 4 and ISO 5, uh, I, it's actually IS and not ISO, both of those standards, which have to do with gear talking with one another, more and more people in the broadcast industry, that is manufacturers, are paying attention to that. And this is starting to be supported. So I know that you can go to Snell and you can go to Axon and you can go to um, Cobalt Digital. All of those, all of those companies have multiple devices that you can take AES off a network or put AES, uh, <coughs> sorry, 67 on a network. People are starting to pay attention and are starting to do this. Um, right, and this, is, and this is your part. It is really helpful to everybody in the industry if, if the response is we don't do that or we do that a little bit, then we think the industry response should be that's not good enough. You need to be able to connect audio as easily as I connect SDI. Which was, by the way, if anyone remembers, a painful process in itself. Uh, we're going to stop. We're going to stop there. Uh, I'm going to ask Dan to come up. Uh, thank you so much. You've been so incredibly patient. <laughs> and then, while he comes up, it's another opportunity, please, to get a drink. I see coffee was brought.